Hello everyone, uh, my name is Rama, Rama Nishtala. I work in Cisco Systems in the UCS group. I work with mostly with the customers like in a post install uh, things and you know some of the data center solutions. So I'm going to present something on uh, how to use you know multiple strap clusters with OpenStack. This actually came out as a pain point when I was working with some of the customers. So the pain point was quite simple. That is, you know, like 10 years back when, you know, there was no open stack, there is nothing like a Ceph or even like an SDS term was coined or not. I'm not sure. But, you know, when I used to go to my storage admin and I used to say that, okay, this is where, you know, my Apache server is running. I have to cache the images here. This is what is my OLTP database is. And you, you know, it, it requires a lot of IOPS. But, you know, after two or three days, you know, I want some data to be moved. And uh, after that, after three, four days, you know, you just push it to the tape. So this is a traditional requirement that existed in the storage field, and it is nothing new. However, you know, when OpenStack and Ceph came, you know, people started misinterpreting it. Okay, there is a magic wand in OpenStack and Ceph. You know, it will work for you by automatically. What I want to emphasize is, it won't. There are ways of doing it through Ceph. So you know, better leverage it instead of thinking that okay, Ceph doesn't work, or you know, this hardware doesn't work. So let's see what is. Uh, we know when a tenant comes to you with the storage requirements, what are they? Came, they come up with you know different types of requirements. They have a different RPO, RTO objectives. They have you know high IOPS, low latency, you know good amount of bandwidth. But not all the requirements from all the tenants is the same, right? Now that is one side of the coin. If you see the second side of the coin, if you are a hosting provider, what are your requirements? Your requirements are again sometimes they are even tangential to what you know tenant has. You want a low uh, power, a low cooling requirements. You you want a you know better consumption of your data center space. You want a high dense storage solutions. So they are something different than what actually tenant is looking for. Now where does these two people go? They come to you. And what you do is, you know, to figure out, you know, how to solve all these problems. Now, if you see here, starting from, you know, what is your failure domains, what is your, you know, back reference parameter should be set up, high availability, RPO, RTO, there are so many things that are with you to solve, and you know, they come to you for a solution. And here, I am only keeping the st storage. Uh, requirements here. I have not come to the, you know, Neutron or, you know, the compute, right? So how do we solve this problem? So this is what, you know, I would like to say, this is a problem that, you know, some of the customers I have worked with are facing and, you know, how we could actually resolve it. So to do that, I have done some case study and I took some, you know, three to five configurations of hardware that, you know, I had with me. But don't misinterpret the results. This was just, you know, conceptual testing. It's not like, you know, benchmark data that I'm trying to share with you all. Uh, and also, to, I used the Ceph benchmarking tool in order to arrive at these values. And I did not use any of the kernel RBD or the object, you know, test cases. I just used, you know, libRBD in order to see how these particular hardwares are, you know, working with. Having said that, I came up with, you know, five different configurations. You know, in one configuration, I had a single RU box, uh, which had, you know, just eight slots for me. So I thought, okay, let me pack this up with SSDs and see how that particular box is working. And the second and third categories, what you see uh, on the right is, the second one is, you know, it, it's a 24 slots box. So I put, you know, small form factor. I just had like 1.2 terabytes disks. I just put it there. And I took like a 1 is to 5 ratio and, you know, populated four of them with, uh, you know, SSDs. So basically, I used a general ratio of 1 is to 5. And the same thing I have done for the other, the third category, which is the large form factor. I had six terabyte of drives. And then, you know, I made out of 12 slots, I made two of them as, you know, my SSDs and the rest 10 as my regular hard disks. At the same time, I also had, you know, the dense storage boxes with me, which has, like, in a 4 RU, they almost come, like, 350 to uh, 350 terabytes of space today. But this is only with 6 terabytes disks because, you know, it had almost, like, 60 slots. The only difference between the two models is the terabyte of space is same in both the cases. But the second one had, you know, it's a dual node. So basically, I am comparing a two socket versus four sockets, right? I mean, I'm doubling the cores for the same number of spindle and seeing, you know, what is the throughput and the bandwidth that I'm getting. 
Having said that, so this is what I got it uh, with my initial testing. I just took you know 4K and you know 4M, the most popular models in the Ceph world to see you know what I am getting. So from IOPS perspective, if you look at the model, you will find out that you know obviously the SSDs are winning. So that means if IOPS is actually a requirement, that means SSD is a solution for you. But does it mean that SSD is a solution for everything? Probably not. So that's what you know we'll see in the next coming up the slides. The same way, you know, if you go for the right side of the graph, they are doing a reasonably good amount of IOPS. However, if you see the latency wise, they are not. Right? That means if IOPS is a requirement, you know, high latency is a requirement, you are going to the left. But on the right side, you know, your latency is actually dropping for you. So those are the categories which will probably not suit to you if you have a high latency requirement, right? The same applies for the bandwidth. And I have just taken three variables here, and you guys can, you know, test it out and plot it more. A better way of doing that in, you know, the, the industry standard, I thought, okay, let me calculate, you know, per OSD, what are the figures I'm getting it, right? So again, IOPS per OSD, you know, the I have drawn uh, against writes. In fact, if I would have taken for reads, probably you would not be able to see the right side of the graph because they are much, much better in terms of reads. So uh, if you look at the, you know, write performance and the IOPS and all, you will see, again, SSD wins here. But if you look at the bandwidth, or if you if you see at you know what is the terabyte of space that I am getting uh, per rack unit, then obviously SSD is not. So what this translates to is okay if a tenant wants a high um, uh, a high IOPS and a low latency requirement, then probably SSDs are good. But if he's looking for in a backup or archival and those type of you know needs, then probably that's not the one you should go for a different category, right? Now, so I try to, you know, come up with this model wherein, okay, let's have a multiple pools, let's have a multiple clusters, or maybe, you know, you could actually do in a hybrid approach to, to solve this. Now, how does, you know, through multiple pools in Ceph, do you can resolve this problem? This is very simple. What you have in, you know, today in a crush hierarchy is, you know, it's very simple. You have a bucket types, you have a buckets, and of course the devices are, you know, mapped to one particular buckets, and you tie up all these three with your rule. So the same thing you could as well do even with your pools also. You can define a bucket type as your pool. And you know within those bucket types, you can say, OK, one is my SAS pool, one is my SSD pool, and SATA pool, and then you, you can carve out volumes. And depending upon your tenant's requirement, exactly you give these volumes to your tenants, right? By that, you would be optimizing what exactly the tenant wants. OK, he wants you know backup. He's doing only a backup. He doesn't really care for a really good amount of IOPS. Yes, you guess, give them a dense storage solution so you'll be saving on your data center space right the same uh, something similar for multiple clusters too uh, but of course we, uh, we have to take the help of cinder configuration here so basically you define you know a different config sections in your cinder file with the volume backend and then you know you map it with your extra specifications in cinder and this is not something new, and it has been. I think it is there also in the web. The only thing I want to emphasize is folks are, my observation is folks are just, they just go for one type of hardware and one type of, you know, Ceph, and they think, you know, that should solve all of the requirements, which is probably, you know, not correct. And hybrid approach, I mean, to my, to my testing, I felt, you know, we should be a little bit careful because the more the number of pools that you carve out and the more the number of clusters you have, you definitely will have some type of, you know, maintenance you know, overhead, because if you have, say, 10 physical racks of, you know, 42 RUs, if you have 10 uh, racks of servers, you have to have, uh, you know, a control of, you know, how many volumes, where these volumes are going to what tenants, so that whenever you want to upgrade, you know, Ceph upgrade or, you know, hardware upgrades, you should be a bit careful to control this, right? So that is one of the caveats in the whole model. Having said that, you know, you could actually come up with many graphs like this. What is a capacity optimized solution? What is, you know, power optimized? What is performance optimized type of solutions? And, you know, come up with, don't go with all the five categories, but with two or three categories of class of servers, I think you should be able to make up your solution. 
So these are the conclusions. So my say, don't expect you know magic wand from Sapphire OpenStack. There is a way to leverage it. It has something today, so you can as well do it. And you can uh, use the Ceph pools or the multiple clusters option. And the third option also, uh, the fourth bullet point is what I observed as part of my testing is you know how you can actually use you know quality of service. So QoS has actually we found out that the reads have actually you know the way if you traditionally if you see the Ceph documentation everyone would say that yeah you will have you know say 110 gigabit for your public 110 gigabit for your private but if you are in a replicated model not in a erasure coding model but if you are doing a replication testing then you would figure out that your cluster network is not being used at all it is just sitting idle it's not doing anything so what we thought is okay let us create one virtual pipe on for all these complete 20 gigabit but you know, share it between both you know public as well as private. But you define QoS in a way that your you know cluster uh, cluster writes will get a good preference. What it means is in a replicated model, you would actually using the 20 complete 20 gigabit form for your public because the writes uh, when the customer is requesting a read, your writes are not there. You could as well use a complete 10 gigabit byte too. So that is one of the other uh, conclusions that I drawn as part of this uh, whole case study. And this is what I wanted to share, some of the pain points that I learned from my customers. Uh, then, you know, a little bit of brainstorming. We thought, you know, maybe we can, you know, adopt this particular solution and move ahead. And if you have any questions, we can discuss offline. And thanks for giving me this opportunity.